This podcast is brought to you by Bonus Room Productions, and we own this town. I am Jason T. Mears Esquire. And I'm Kelly Hoyle Bowling. And we are San Dimas Today. How's it going, Kelly? JT. Good to see you again, buddy. Good to see you, man. Good to see you. Uh, I'm pretty stoked for uh, this episode. It's been a while since it's just been you and I sitting down and chatting. I know, right? Having a heart to heart. So we maybe briefly mentioned in the last episode that uh, the 30th anniversary of Excellent Adventure had just passed. And we totally wanted to tear into that, but um, we were going, you know, full break just to embrace our awesome Evan Dorkin interview. Yeah. So, uh, so a great interview, a lot of great feedback and response after that interview. Yeah, it was, it, it was so cool. It's still so cool. I'm, I'm still nerding out about that. My wife has <laughs> officially told me to shut up about it, and I will not. I will not. So, 30th anniversary. Um, right. 30 years ago, dude. Oh, man. Going back in time. 1989. Uh, wrong movie, dude. Hmm. Going back in time. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was the year of Back to the Future 2. Yeah, it was. It was. Uh, um, we were just looking at a list of like the highest grossing movies that year. That was the Last Crusade Batman summer. Oh, man. So... There, there were uh, a lot of good movies that came out. Yeah, um, I, I remember having a day at my summer camp where we had a rain out and we all went to the movies and you got to choose between Batman, Last Crusade, Ghostbusters 2. <laughs> How do you make that choice? How do you make that choice? I chose Last Crusade. Uh, I, I think, think it was pretty right. solid. Yeah. I, I will say this. That year was so good for movies that the best picture winner was Driving Miss Daisy. Oh, man. The best yeah. picture of that year. For that was sure. like the first time Spike Lee got screwed, <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> Always losing to someone yeah, who's driving, right? It, yeah, it's just great that finally, finally, we as a culture have changed and embraced, and uh, <laughs> th- things are a lot better out there for everyone now. Yeah, like yeah. that, we've re- we finally become a meritocracy. <laughs> Way to sneak a little Oscar reference in there. Yeah, it's know, the it's season, fine. right? It's, it, it is. It is. I did not watch, and I am thrilled that I did not. So, I mean, <laughs> Alex Winter wasn't nominated. Keanu Reeves wasn't nominated. Stephen Herrick wasn't nominated. Right. Um, you know. Yeah. No, just I'm not in. There's no point. There's no <laughs> point. <laughs> Can you give a Lifetime Achievement Award to a movie? Because I feel like Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure should get a Lifetime Achievement Oscar. Right. When the universe is still expanding and relevant today. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think it wins. I think so. I think so. I mean... Not making any more Back to the Future movies? No. Why would you? Karate Kids are over with. Well, yeah. I don't know. I'll take that yeah. back. Yeah. Karate Kids are still going. They are. Uh, they Cobra are. Kai. Ghost Second Bu- time we've mentioned Cobra Kai on this podcast. <laughs> right, I know. Uh, also, uh, Ghostbusters is still going. They've got the uh, You're right. Jason Reitman, Jason Reitman reboot, which is going to ignore the other reboot, mm-hmm. which, odd choice, man. Yeah. Odd choice. I mean, you know seems, what? Seems like a lot of, uh, lot of uh, showbiz politics going on there. Yeah. You know what? Hot take. I kind of like the uh, the latest Ghostbusters. I thought it was pretty good. Yeah, hot take. Hot take. It's uh, it's uh, it's our boy Paul, Paul, the Paul director Feig. Paul Feig. Yeah, right. yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, did a great job, great job. Speaking of Paul Feig, I recently saw this totally relates to Bill and Ted. I, I recently saw um, A Simple Favor. That was his latest movie. Okay, so good, right. so good. Nice. I mean, yeah, it it didn't involve musicians or time travel, but. If you can get past those two things, <laughs> really a solid movie. Really a solid movie. All right. I'll try to open my mind. Yeah, you know, crack it open a little bit. So uh, with the 30-year anniversary came a ton of spilled ink on the internet. Uh, think pieces, uh, retrospectives, you know, like it just a lot of people look back at Bill and Ted and had some things to say. I spent probably way too much of my <laughs> time reading these articles and combing through them, seeing if I could find anything new. I, I found out some new stuff. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, one, and I, you know, me, I, I'm sure I'd heard it before, but, uh, Matheson and, uh, Solomon both cited Monty Python as like one of their main inspirations. Right. And <clears throat> I found that really interesting. I, I know they were both sketch comedy guys. I know mm-hmm. I knew that, and, and there was a connection with the crew, right? There, there was a connection with the crew. The production designer uh, that they brought on for the film had worked with John Cleese and Eric Idle. I'm not sure if that was actually on Monty Python projects. 
or just worked with him in individual films and things like Ice Pirates or some, I, I don't <laughs> know. But uh, they brought him on specifically for that, which very interesting. I think if you watch the film, I don't see a lot of Python influence in it. I'm a big comedy nerd. I, I've seen a ton of Python. I've seen a lot of sketch. And maybe a lot of that is just, you know, in the 80s, being a fan of comedy, you didn't have a ton of choices. You know, you could, yeah. you could, you could be like, oh, I'm a... I'm an SNL guy. I love Saturday Night Live. They're hilarious. They influence me. And then if you're cooler, you're like, oh, well, I like SCTV. And then if you're like really deep into the comedy nerd stuff, you know, you're like, I'm a Monty Python guy. Right. You know, the, the, these guys are clearly literate in film writing and sketch comedy. And so I can see why they would uh, maybe, reference that. Maybe some of those early like time travel scenes, I think, are the closest that I feel like maybe you're getting some kind of similarity just with the slapstick of the old West mm-hmm. and uh, getting, you know, when Napoleon blows them up. Right. 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 Like uh, maybe a tinge. Yeah, I don't know but, if that's know, reaching like, too but, far. You know, like but. There, there was, there was clearly slapstick and Python. Right. I mean, sure. Uh, but so much of their comedy seemed like had the absurd to it. And sure. The premise of this movie is completely absurd, granted. Mm-hmm. But, you know, like the, the I don't know, I, I just have trouble making that connection from the film. But I can totally see the original idea, which is something else they spoke about more in depth mm-hmm. with, in these articles, where it was like Bill and Ted going back and basically being the anti forced gumps of history, ruining, ruining everything. Right, causing everything that's bad. Yeah, from like the Titanic to the Holocaust, things mm-hmm. like that. That seems totally Python to me. Yeah. That absolutely does. I could be into like some kind of new uh, streaming service funded series that takes on that idea. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. I'd be into that. I'd, yeah. like to, I'd like to explore that a little bit. I, I absolutely would do it. I think in this era of... Uh, like you're saying, streaming and all, all these great options out there, you've got a lot more opportunity for something like that. Yeah. In the mid 80s, when you're going to sell a teen comedy to a studio, I don't know how convincing, you know, these two guys accidentally caused the Holocaust. Right. Whoops right. a doodle. And uh, so Ed Solomon talked about that a lot recently. He, uh, for the anniversary, posted on Twitter like scans of all these notes. Uh, that he and Chris had when they were originally coming up with the idea, right? Yeah. Uh, before the movie. And they talk about that, like, you know, that hit, it was going to be Hitler and not Napoleon, right? Right. And they just realized that that wasn't going to fly, you know? <laughs> right. Can't just drop Hitler back off in Germany after <laughs> yeah. the here, after it's over. <laughs> here you go, Adolf. Have fun, duder. <laughs> uh. But the idea that they like, they, like, screw everything up, I mean, obviously it changes the complete tone of the movie when you turn it into that and not saving the world right right right. (laughs) but it's still a great idea yeah yeah it is uh i also like a lot of the articles that i read leaned heavily on the fact that their first choice supposedly you know i I think uh who did chris say the first their first choice for uh rufus was was it like van david lee roth david lee roth yeah yeah yeah. so uh, most of these articles are like well they really wanted sean connery and i'm like okay (laughs) sure i mean i can i can see who didn't want Sean Connery in their movie in the mid '80s? I would say if if it had been Diamond Dave, mm-hmm. movie still would be good. Sure. I okay. mean, I love. I mean, it's it's Carlin. Carlin is Rufus. Mm-hmm. But don't ad- underestimate Diamond Dave. Oh, yeah, I mean, especially 1989 Diamond Dave. That man was an entertainer. That man was an entertainer. <laughs> uh, I found it interesting that so many articles were regurgitating that factoid, which I'm not quite sure is actually a factoid. You know, like uh, they wanted Sean Connery. They wanted Sean Connery. They wanted Sean Connery. Yeah. And they, well, well, right. They were saying, wait, you're a casting director. You make the list. Mm-hmm. You make it with like the number one guy, right? Right, 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 <laughs> right. Because what the original uh, Bill and Ted, they wanted uh, Anthony Michael Hall and Michael J. Fox. Right. right. <laughs> Which would have never worked. We no. know that now. Yes. Yeah. But at the time, I guess you just say Right. And and again, you know, Sean Connery that year did have Last Crusade come out. The man w- was doing all right. And I feel like he spent a lot of his 80s in kind of movie purgatory doing really weird stuff. Mm-hmm. And then, like, I feel like uh, Last Crusade kind of put him back on the map as an A-lister. And then he had another eight, ten years of, of super relevancy and just being amazing before <laughs> doing, like, his dragon movies and stuff. I don't know. Just made me think what would be awesome is if we could just recut every scene with Lincoln, yes. but have Daniel Day Lewis's Lincoln do it. Yes, 
please. Oh, like Funny or Die or right. somebody like come that can make that happen, come right? Come on. Come on. Yeah, that, that would be phenomenal. Phenomenal. <laughs> and speaking of the casting of Rufus, I was thinking recently about uh, conversations we've had in the past with Rufus's daughter. And, you know, it seemed like every time we've talked about it, the uh, actresses and comedians we, we've come up with have been from the sketch comedy world, which would make sense. But I think I've got a better idea. Helen Mirren. Whoa. All right. I think. Because you can't put an age on Rufus's daughter. She's from the future. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Brilliant. I, You're brilliant. And I feel like it might, it, it could potentially be problematic in today's day and age if you have somebody younger than Bill and Ted coming and saying, hey, you've got to help the future. Because then you don't have a mentor figure coming back. You've got a... a mm-hmm. You know, woman in peril, which we don't need. That that doesn't belong in the the Bill and Ted universe. That's not what they're about. I mean, I realize that they do save the Could, princesses at the yeah. end, but you get Helen Mirren for Rufus's daughter, right? Exactly. She comes back. She still has an air of authority. She's right. still a badass. Mm-hmm. And you know, they're going. They're absolutely going to listen to her. I don't know. It, I think it just, it's great. Yeah. I, I like that suggestion. I like the idea of of uh, Rufus's daughter being older. Um, like you said, having the authority, crack the whip. When needed, if needed, you know. Yeah, maybe. It sounds like with the premise that that maybe they're going to be a little more jaded or disillusioned now, right? Right, right. And, you know. Potentially. And, and, and so that, that maybe that's what they need. They need Helen Mirren to kick him in the ass. Yeah. I mean, yes. And it, it's not like she's, you know, quote unquote, above doing it. I mean, she's done other great fun roles. You know, mm-hmm. she, she absolutely has a sense of humor about her and. She's, I mean, she's been in the Fast and the Furious movies, you know? It's like, great. <laughs> she plays Jason Statham's mom. It's yeah, she's, awesome. She's great. She is, she is fantastic. So I just wanted to, to bring that up. Um, other things I, I found of interest reviewing all these articles, I found four or five articles referring to the homophobic slur that we've discussed. Mm-hmm. Like entire articles about it. Like Bill and Ted's 30 years old. Here's what's problematic. And, you know, we, yep. we've discussed that. I mean, it's it's a valid point, but it's interesting that this movie's 30 years old and they use a homophobic slur. Yes. And it it's one of the worst right. parts of the movie. But. but it's also very reflective, especially of the time, that that homophobic slur. Now, we've discussed that, you know, I definitely don't agree that it should have really been used for a comedic expense and it dates the movie, but that's also kind of the point, you know, and... I mean, it, unfortunately, in 1989, Daily Speak was pretty unwoke. Yes, <laughs> for sure. I, but the, a lot of the articles did point out it, it's like the one really sour note um, of the movies. It, yeah. I found it interesting that so many articles were written about that point. Mm-hmm. One of them did um, also raise the fact that Power Tools Two Heads Are Better Than One is a super weird choice to end that movie. <laughs> so I, I felt a little vindicated. Yeah, because, definitely. You know, like deep cut for us, but you know, we planted that flag, Mother Scratchers. So yeah, yeah. You know, um, part of Ed Solomon's tweets with the notes is they uh, had talked about a joke that they were going to make uh, about uh, little people. Hmm. And um, definitely glad they didn't put that in. Yeah, that would have been one more that would not have rung well. Right. It it it, it seems like for a while these characters, Bill and Ted, were uh, skewed meaner for sure. Skewed me even from our conversation with Chris, where he's talking about the fat jokes with with uh, Ted's mom. Mm-hmm. You know that that just doesn't fit in with the movie. And I don't know if you add that, and if you add these jokes that. We're sitting here 30 years later having a podcast discussion about Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Yeah. I mean, the one thing that all of these articles talk about, almost all the reviews, positive and negative, talk about like the joy and enthusiasm uh, between Bill and Ted and their friendship and how that is like the driving factor of the movie. And it, mm-hmm. it, it is, there's so much great stuff in these movies, but that is the stuff that has people like you and I coming back. Yeah. Now, something that I had found when kind of looking through the Twitter account and all of these scan notes tweets is that he had mentioned something about how the two of them had tried and failed writing a Gremlins 2 script. What? I, I'm i pretty sure I read that right. Okay, I when, might be totally wrong, when, when but you, I would want to for sure guarantee, but there was they also had a Gremlins joke that they had baked in in the early version when it was going to be Hitler. 
oh. that Hitler was off at the movie theater watching Gremlins. Huh. And then a joke about the gremlin in the microwave or something. Okay. So. All right. All right. Interesting. Yeah. But I don't know how official that attempt to rewrite or, or attempt to write the script would was, you know? So. Yeah. That, that's super interesting. Mm-hmm. That's really interesting. Uh, going back and, and looking at Ed Solomon and Chris uh, Matheson at this point in their careers, you know, a, a lot of articles point out that they, they were really on the rise. They had, they had great comedic pedigree. Uh, working with Gary Shandling, they had great, uh, you know, I think Ed Solomon, when he was in high school, was submitting scripts to Laverne and Shirley. I mean, th- these guys were known and were able to get meetings, mm-hmm. you know, and that just. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it could totally make sense that they were out there pitching Gremlins too, or trying to write it or a spec script or something. But uh, again, that's Joe Dante's baby. Don't, <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't want to live in a world where Joe Dante doesn't make Gremlins too. Well, so he directed, but didn't write, I believe. Joe Dante did not write Gremlins 2? I think that might have been Chris Columbus. I mean, Chris Columbus directed the first one. I think he wrote it, and Dante directed both. Am I nuts? <clears throat> you might be, but we can edit this part out. Yeah, we're going to have to because... <laughs> oh, my God. I'm looking at this up now because I am ashamed of myself. I think you're right. Christopher Columbus did... I mean, yeah, he absolutely did write and then Dante directed. So I don't know if that means that they were looking, uh, you know, exploring other writers before they, did they go back to Columbus for Gremlins 2? Chris Columbus did write with Gremlins 2. Okay. Man, oh my God. Okay. What is wrong with me? I, I'm going to fire myself from this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought it was funny that they had originally kind of baked a Gremlins joke into it. Yeah. Because I guess at the time they were coming up with the ideas Gremlins is still pretty fresh. Yeah. So that was what, like 84 maybe? Yeah. Yep. And, you know, if they were, this thing got filmed in 86, 87 and sat on the shelf for a little while. I mean, when they're doing the script, that's absolutely right at that point. And back in that day, you know, movies would linger in theaters. You didn't have the hundreds of movies being released a year that you have now. You had movie houses with maybe two, three screens. And so, you know, they would run a movie into the ground. So, I mean, Gremlins <laughs> probably was in theaters for over a year, I would imagine. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So one of the other things that uh, Ed was talking about, um, and you may have read this before, but he had mentioned that, hey, if the quote, be excellent to each other is all like Chris or I are remembered for, that that'd probably be okay with me. <laughs> yeah. Um, he also mentioned that when you actually go to San Dimas, California, the sign there says, however many years old. San Dimas is, it's like 70 years of being excellent. Oh, wow. Yeah. Nice. So that's pretty good. Hey, you know who's going to see that this uh, this Labor Day weekend? You and I. You and I. Yeah, we're we, we going to be- We're going making, down. We're making our sojourn. Come Labor Day weekend, it's going to be pretty mm-hmm. fantastic. Can't wait. Yeah, yeah. It's going to be excellent. It'll be water park season. Can we work in the water park? I don't no. see why we can't. Yeah. I mean- it's actually not the same water park. Though. Right, right, right. The water right. park is in Arizona, and it's still open. And you can actually go down the water slides. Can I? The Napoleon went down. Mm-hmm. All right. We can do this. Okay. So maybe maybe we need a separate Phoenix trip. <laughs> I I can see no problem. I, I, I don't think my wife would have any issue with me taking two separate vacations with you this year. I thought that was the deal yeah. when you guys got married. <laughs> right. We discussed this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Jenny. <laughs> All right, so 30th anniversary. Uh, it's pretty amazing that 30 years later, here we are doing a podcast it's about the even, Bill and Ted movies. Even more amazing that all four of you out there are listening to this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and fingers crossed, we still hope we're going to hear word on uh, green light for shooting the movie sometime soon. Yeah, I saw something on in- Instagram. People are saying that, uh, you know, like they've started shooting, but I don't think that's true. Like people are saying, yeah, yeah. They, they've started filming. But it, Ed, Ed has been pretty up on it. Mm-hmm. If you follow his Twitter feed, I think you're you're going to get the best updates you can get. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, one other thing, uh, those really cool toys, we, we posted about it on our Facebook feed. There are some really great Bill & Ted action figures that oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Are, are being released, and you can you can pre-order those. They look very, very sweet. <laughs> very you, sweet. If you got the money. Yeah, yeah. Got to pay to play. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. <laughs> what is it, 30, 40 bucks per action figure? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I got no big deal. Yeah. <laughs> got nothing else to live for. Um, 
So, you know, one of the other things we just did here recently, um, as, as listeners may already know, uh, Alex Winter, who played Bill, uh, has become a pretty distinguished uh, documentary filmmaker. Yeah, absolutely. Um, over, what, the last 15, 20 years now? Uh, you know, the first, I think his first major documentary was Downloaded, mm-hmm. which I think came out roughly six years ago, maybe five years oh, ago. Oh, is it that recent? Yeah, Downloaded, the Napster oh. documentary. I, I guess I, know I thought this. that was older. I saw, I, I, I know roughly the same time period because I saw him introduce it uh, at a double bill in Chicago at the Music Box Theater. They, uh, they did download it, then they did a screening of Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. And uh, my wife and I got to go see that r- like a year after my daughter was born. So You're right. You're right. It's 2012. Hey, hey look at there me. There you go, man. Yeah. You redeemed yourself. Oh, my goodness. It's about time. <laughs> Redemption within a single episode yes. of this podcast. <laughs> nice nice character arc, Jason. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to really look back on this episode. Yeah. Oh, man. So uh, download, came through. download it is great if you haven't mm-hmm. seen it. it. One of the things that's really cool about it, uh, about the rise and fall of Napster, Alex Winter knew these guys personally as this stuff was happening. Like he, I, at least I think when it was happening, he he knew the Napster guys, so he was able to get in and get access and get some, you know, real, real insight into the whole downfall of Napster. Super worth watching. Um, if I'm assuming most of the people listening to this podcast remember Napster, um, if you don't, that's where we pirated all of our music when we were kids because we didn't know that music shouldn't be free. You and I knew. Yes. Yeah, we did. We, we always did. knew. Yeah, we always knew. Um, super cool. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely check it out. It seems like most of his documentaries do have a technology bent to it, which is great. He seems to have a firm hold on the state of technology and cutting edge technology, and he brings insight of that into uh, most of his films. Yeah, he did a blockchain documentary recently. I think this is his most recent one, Trust yep. Machine. Mm-hmm. I can't wait to see that. I think like Rosario Dawson is the narrator for yes. that. Yes, yep, yep. Very cool. Mm-hmm. Um, but just this week, Amazon Prime started streaming uh, Panama Papers, mm-hmm. Panama Papers. And so both Kelly and I watched that this week to bone up and see see how things are going. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, very insightful. Yeah, I mean it's a it's a major story that it still feels like even though the impact that caused, you know, prime ministers were resigned or sent to jail, mm-hmm. it still seems like in our country that has not gotten the coverage it, it needed to. Right. Uh, yeah. Um, I was sitting or, there with- or we're just so desensitized to to corruption that it doesn't matter. Oh, man. Yeah. You know. I was watching it with my wife and she's like it's a shame that there was no down or, you know, fallout from all of this. And I was like, well, yeah, you're right. And then the end of the movie comes up and they're like, this person went to jail. This person resigned. This yeah. person. It was across the world. Mm-hmm. These major figures were mm-hmm. f- facing huge fallout from it. Yeah. America, not so much. But the finances the, or the finance issues that they found with Americans, that's feeding into other current investigations going on right now. So there may be fallout yet to be had. Who knows? My, I don't we'll know. see. I, I don't follow you know? those. I don't know what you're talking about. So. <laughs> But it, it's it was a, it's a great story, and all of these journalists that were involved and the secrecy that they kept uh, to uncover probably the biggest global corruption scandal in the history of mankind. <laughs> Is that the best way to put yeah, it? Yeah, it's, it's nuts. It, it's like it's it's only that big of a deal. But um, I did feel like structurally, uh, maybe the documentary could have been a little bit tighter, just sort of. When it would go from interview to interview, it got a little all over the place. Mm-hmm. Um, so sometimes I wasn't quite sure where I was at. Maybe that's just me needing a little bit more of a timeline. <laughs> I don't know. You know, <laughs> uh, I would say it was beautiful for a documentary. Like a uh, shot in high quality HD looked very nice. Oh, yeah, it looked great. Uh, the access that he got and the interviews that he had explaining the situation, I thought, did a, a great job. Um, I was a little bit – there's – there's a trope in documentaries where you're talking about the impact of people or on everyday people. And then you will show three or four random individuals staring into the camera. And it's like, here are individuals. These individuals are yeah. affected by this thing. And, yeah. and that happened two or three times in the movie, which, yeah. you know, it, you got to do it. You have to humanize things. It's right. Just- and sometimes I feel like it would generalize a little bit w- with the uh, nuts and bolts of 
of the actual financial corruption, the money that was being washed or hidden in these offshore accounts. Like, I wanted a little bit more of how did they do it? Yeah. When it just got kind of glossed over a little more than I would have liked. Yes. Yeah. Um, but maybe that's a choice you make uh, when you're thinking about your viewers and how into the weeds do you go with that. Right. I can understand. And also, I, I was surprised. I was expecting it to focus more on the actual uh, Panama Papers themselves and the actual scandal. What the movie actually ended up being more about was the concerted effort by these international right. journalists celebrating the journalists yeah the sure. journalists actually going after it doing it right mm-hmm. nobody sold each other out yeah. i mean they and the ultimate price that some of them paid oh man yeah you know? oh man uh, just oh yeah i mean it yeah it, it was it was definitely powerful and that was a gut punch from that point of view for that sure that was a gut punch mm-hmm. i you know there are things i would have done a little bit differently but i'm not a filmmaker and yeah. i will say my life is richer for having watched that uh, documentary and i'm definitely I'm uh, trying not to take my life as for granted as I did before watching yeah. that. I think what we're saying is if you've got Prime, check it out. For, even if you don't, go rent it. It's fine. Get yeah. It. See yeah, it. Yeah. See it. Um, I also saw Winner's almost done filming his Zappa documentary. Yes. Very excited for that. Yes. Um, he's he's the first guy, I believe, to do a Zappa doc with the full approval of the Zappa Trust, which now that Frank's wife's dead, it's his son, Amit. Um, that that's kind of calling the show there. And of course there's a lot of fraternal drama going on with the Zappa family. That, you say, of course, but I'm not sure everyone out there knows. Yeah, they might not know, but, uh, Dweezil and Ahmet Zappa, who are the sons of Frank Zappa are kind of having uh, issues with what's happening with, uh, control of the Zappa trust. Um, and I think if you want to know more than that, you should probably check out the documentary whenever it comes out. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> You're listening to Zappa today. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, um, so this this is kind of a catch-all, catch-up episode. I want to throw this out there to our listeners. We still have plenty of San Dimas Today stickers left. So mm-hmm. if you do uh, want a San Dimas Today sticker, we'd be more than happy to mail yeah, you yeah. one. Just uh, hit us up on, on Facebook, Facebook <laughs> Instagram, or Twitter <laughs> at San Dimas Today. Yeah. Uh, send us your uh, address. We'll be happy to mail one of those out to you. Um, they are a real treat. Also, and speaking of real treats, our producer, Michael, got you and I both Bill and Ted. Bill and Ted pens. Yeah. Th- these you got a little Bill, I get a little Ted. This is perfect. Yeah. I'm just so I love happy. It. And my sticker's on my computer that I use for this podcast. Nice. Uh, my sticker's uh, on my car. So Perfect. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's a... Uh, Thank you, Michael Leeds, and we own this town for our Bill and Ted pin and for producing our podcast. <laughs> uh, and thank you to Scott Bricklin and Scooby Tunes Music for the use of the most excellent song, uh, Walk Away. And hey, uh, Scott, if you want a sticker, let us know. We'd be happy to send you one. Yeah. yeah. And hey, everybody out there listening, please be excellent to each other. And party on, dudes. Okay, so you've got uh, the original movie, you have the sequel, you have the cartoon, you have the other cartoon that went from, you know, the different uh, Fox, then you have the TV show, then you have the serial, you have the action figures, you have the board game, you have the trading cards, you have... Uh, Dorkin. Oh, I mean, the comic books. Yeah, you oh, have yeah. the comic books. You have... Um, two other series of comic books. You also have both soundtracks. You have reissues of the soundtrack. The first one, you have the film soundtracks by David Newman. Uh, you also have t-shirts. You have um, pins. You have stickers. You have a cookie jar, a uh, actually licensed cookie jar for, that is in the shape of the uh, uh, time booth. Um Ah, you got the sweatshirt my wife made that looks like Bill's sweatshirt, which is pretty great, but I don't know if that's, you know, canon. <laughs> <laughs>